Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron. Now, every now and again in my study and preparation, I find a sermon that I just kind of fall in love with. And so it is this morning. This is a sermon by uh, the great Charles Spurgeon, a 19th century preacher. And um, he delivered it to uh, New Park Street Chapel, Southwark. Um, I think that's part of London in August of 1857. The title is Jesus Only. His text is Mark's text for the Transfiguration, um, where Jesus is a, a brilliant white with Moses and Elijah on the mountain. And then at the end, they only see Jesus. So the title is Jesus Only. I've um, edited it down and changed very few words, um, make it a little easier on modern audiences. Here we go. This was the last sight the disciples had on the mountain, and it seems to me to have been the best. They saw Jesus only. Suddenly Moses and Elijah vanished from their sight, and then they saw no man anymore save Jesus only. Beloved children of God, when it comes to our faith, we are to think of Jesus only. We have no business with anything except Jesus only. We are to forget that we have a spouse and children, that we have a house or a barn, that we have fields or a shop. We are not to recollect anything about these things here, but to say, in so far as we can, far from my thoughts, vain world begone, leave my religious hours alone. Vain would my eyes, my Savior, see, I wait a visit, Lord, from thee. My heart grows warm with holy fire, and kindles with a pure desire. Come, my dear Jesus, from above, and feed my soul with heavenly love. Remember, my friends, that you are God's saints. There are many religious controversies which shake the world, but you have nothing to do with them this morning. When you come to the Lord's house, the Lord's table, you have nothing to do with the question of whether baptism is by immersion or by sprinkling, and nothing to do with the question whether churches should be governed by bishops or by elders. You have nothing to do with what anybody else in the whole world believes. You have nothing to think of except these two things. You, a sinner loved by your gracious Savior, try if you can to fix your thoughts on these facts. I was lost, perishing, and ruined through my own sins, but glory be to God, the all-sufficient atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ has set me free and made me an heir of heaven. Oh, make Jesus only the subject of your thought and your trust, and at this table, cast aside everything else and come just as you are to him, and it will be a precious encounter with the Lord Jesus that you will have indeed. I'm going to speak to you about Jesus only and show you that it must be Jesus only for your justification. It must be Jesus only for your sanctification. It must be Jesus only for your object in life. And it must be Jesus only for your hope of heaven. I remind you that justification is the process through which we are saved from our sins. It is the first kind of grace, an essential part of our salvation. We were born fools, and we shall continue fools till we get to heaven. And one of the foolish things that is always sprouting out of us is our wanting to put something else alongside Christ, with Christ, in the matter of our justification. You tell me you never do that, but I am sure you do. It is a hard thing to stick fast by this fundamental truth, Jesus only, as the rock and foundation of our salvation. Remember, Christian, that the meritorious cause of your salvation is not the least degree dependent upon yourself. It is dependent on Jesus only. The Lord Jesus has covenanted for you that you will present your soul unblemished and complete before the glory of his face with joys divinely great. Oh, beloved, always hang your confidence where it ought to be. Jesus only, and then you will find yourself full of sin and wickedness, 
and grieve over it. But do not think that the ground of your hope is one whit less firm for all of that. When sin prevails and guilt rises, remember, as your righteousness cannot make Christ's righteousness any better, so your sin cannot make it any worse. And then, will you please to recollect that all your good works do not make you any the safer. If you were to die the moment you believed and never did a single good work in your life, you would be as sure of heaven as you would be if you lived to love and serve your master with all your soul and all your might. Remember that the saint who lives from day to day devoting all to Christ, spending and being spent in his master's service has more happiness than the saint who is not so full of love, but he is not one whit more secure. Be active and you will be happy, but do not be active in order to be safe. Our security lies not in anything that we do or do not do. It lies in the covenant of free and sovereign grace. And the only basis of our salvation is that Christ died for our sins, for us. Yea, rather, that is risen again. And he is now at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. I want you also to recollect that all your sufferings do not make you any safer. They may make you better by God's grace, but they do not make you any more sure of heaven. They are not meritorious afflictions. Persons often misjudge concerning their troubles. They think they are punishments for sin. Let the child of God remember that God never punishes his children for sin. God's people were punished once for all in the person of their scapegoat and surety, Jesus Christ, and God will never punish twice for the same offense. The chastisements of God's providence are fatherly acts of his love. They are not the wrathful acts of his justice. As the righteous judge, God cannot punish either you or me. We are believers in Jesus. But now I ask you, beloved, do you not frequently find when you feel strong in the faith, when you've been praying in church and helping the poor, when the minister has patted you on the back and said what a good job you did, do you not find that in a day or two you get so dull and low that you could not tell what was the matter with you? Have you never thought what was the cause of it? You were feeling so good, and now you have lost all your hope and confidence. And so you come again a guilty sinner to Christ's mercy and take his love and blood to be your only trust. Do you know why it was that you were low in spirit? It was for this reason. Unconsciously to yourself, you'd been leaning a little on your good works. Whenever you get into a heavy, dull frame, just spell out those two words, Jesus only, until you are bound to say that it must be there and there alone that you can put your confidence and trust. Next section. It must be Jesus only to sanctify us. Some people don't think so. We are justified by God, they say, but we have to sanctify ourselves, transform ourselves in a sense. And they believe in what they call progressive sanctification. Is that scriptural or not? Well, I have always thought that sanctification is continual, but I am not sure that it is progressive. I have heard many a venerable saint whose hairs are silvered over with gray say, I think my heart is as bad as it ever was, and I am sure if it is not actually so, I think it is, and it plagues me more than it ever did. <laughs> we often shake our head at the young and pray for them in the slippery paths of youth but the paths of old age are quite as slippery. They are all slippery paths, all the way to heaven. The old nature remains in us, unchanged and unchangeable, and there will have to be a fight between the new nature and the old nature, until in the end the new shall triumph, and we shall get clean from sin. Beloved, do not expect that your old nature will get holier every day, 
and in your sanctification, take this for your motto, Jesus only. Next section. Now, dear friends, I speak of Jesus only as the object of our lives. Oh, I pray to the Holy Spirit to so enter our hearts and minds and consciences and judgments and affections that every idolatrous love, all affection toward everything but Christ, may be cast out of all the Lord's family so that they may be brought to set Jesus on the throne of their hearts and to utterly crush every rival. Oh, brothers and sisters, we do not love Jesus Christ as we should. If we saw the ocean of Christ's love coming toward us and the trickle of our love running towards him, what a shocking contrast we would see. There is his love. I cannot see across it. It is a sea without a shore. There is his love. I cannot fathom it. But oh, here is our love. It is a little stream that is almost dry. It is so small that it might take an hour to scoop up so much as a cupful to give it to the Lord's poor family. I'm reminded of a hymn that I do not like. Tis a point I long to know. Oft it causes me anxious thought. Oh, do I love the Lord or no? Am I his or am I not? Why the uncertainty? because we have so little love. Otherwise, we would know whether we love him or not. If we loved him more, there would be no doubt about it. I beseech you, dear friends, do not be content with the poor little paltry love you already have. Ask him who gave you that little which you have to give you a thousand times more. Do not sing the hymn, had I 10,000 hearts, dear Lord, I'd give them all to thee. Do not wish for so many hearts. Try and give him the one you have, and that will be enough for you. Ask that your whole heart may be offered on the altar, that your whole tongue may be dedicated to God, and that your body, soul, and spirit may be a whole burnt offering, holy and acceptable unto God, presented to him as your reasonable service. Jesus only, put that on your banner and go on fighting for Jesus only. Do not strive for sect or party. Strive not for self or family. Strive not for thine own aggrandizement or wealth, but sanctify all that you do, sacred or secular, with this motto, I do it for Jesus only. Last section. Jesus only is our one hope of heaven. And what do I hope to have when I die? If I may answer in the words of my text, my hope is Jesus only. Who have I in heaven but him? The heaven of your heart and the only heaven that can content it is Jesus only. To lie in his embrace, to be passed to his bosom, to feel the kisses of his lips, to drink the wine of his eternal love, to be forever steeped in the ocean of his grace, to know his heart to behold his countenance, to admire his beauties, and to be swallowed up in his glory is the highest ambition of the believer. Well, we may sing, when shall I see thy smiling face, that face which often I have seen? Arise, thou son of righteousness, scatter the clouds that intervene. And also, O oh, when, thou city of God, Shall I thy courts ascend, where congregations never break up and Sabbaths have no end? Oh, then, oh, when I shall behold my Savior, and wrapped in his embrace, blessed be forever. And so Jesus only is our one hope of heaven. Now, poor Christian, you have this precious treasure, have you not? I was wondering how a man would feel if he could say that he had nothing in the world but Jesus only. You do not know, and I do not know. Let's think about money. You have a pretty fair income now. You are tolerably well off, and you have good, strong limbs. You can work and earn your living. But now suppose there is a man somewhere on the face of the earth who can say, I have not a rag nor a crust. I have not the whole world so much as one solitary dollar. 
I have no health. I am sickly as I can be. I have no frame. I have no friends. I have buried the last of my family. I have no earthly hopes, no prospects. All that I have is Jesus only. Now I can imagine, nay, I can express my firm belief that a consciousness of the possession of Jesus would have such an overwhelming effect on the heart of this poor beggar that he would forget his poverty, forget his nakedness, forget his lack of kindred, and forget his hopelessness. This one thought would swallow up all his misery. I have Christ. How can I be poor when I have him? Now let us consider the opposite case. Think of someone who has a fortune or money enough for your needs. You have a spouse and children. You have houses and lands, name and honor and reputation. You seem to have everything. What is there that you have not got? I go into your pantry. It's well stocked. I go into your parlor. It is well furnished. I look at your bank statement. There is abundance. You have everything that the heart can wish for except Christ. Now, I cannot by any flight of imagination think of you as a happy person. I did not need to stretch my thoughts to think of that poor penniless beggar as being happy after all. But I can't imagine, I cannot imagine that if you know what it is to be without Christ, that you can be a happy man. Just think for a moment what will happen to you if you continue living as you are now. You will die and your soul will be driven into hell. Within a little while, your riches will take themselves to wings and fly away. Your family may die, or if they do not, you will die. You cannot take your money with you. If you are buried in a gold coffin, it will not enrich you, and all your lands will pass to another. Somebody else's eyes must see your fair acres. Someone else's hands shall pluck the fruit from your trees. Think of this, and then remember, all this while you will be in hell, in torments. I cannot think of you as a happy man. Go home, take your wine, and see damnation in its dregs. Go home, and walk over your farm, and see death in its clods, and damnation in its meadows. Go home to your house, and climb its topmost story, and look upon your estates, and see the autumn coming on. And remember that we all do fade as a leaf, and that, if not Christ, our transgressions, like the wind, shall carry us away. Go home, and let the thoughts of eternal fire mingle with all you have. You have all things but Christ. Go then, and stir up your most joyous pleasures in the prospect of eternal wrath. And if you can be happy after that, then I wonder that you are a human being at all. But if you can say, Jesus, well, that is a good start. Go from there and say this, Jesus only. If you have the prospect of losing all, gladly give it up for Christ. If you are afraid that you should not have enough, just be sure of this, that if you have Jesus, you have enough. If the worst should come to pass and you were locked up in prison without a bed to lie on or a crust to eat, if you had Jesus with you, you might be as happy as an angel in your prison. But if you had all the wealth of India, you might be as wretched as a devil if you had not Christ with you. Oh, treasure up the text and make it true of yourself, Jesus only. And you poor souls who are panting to know the way to heaven, remember, there is only one ladder that can take you there. The ladder is called Jesus. The foot rests on the earth in his humanity and the top leans in heaven on his Godhead. Poor sinner, run up the rungs. Do you think you are so heavy that you will break them? Oh, no. There have been some stout old sinners up that ladder before now, but the ladder has never been broken yet and never will be. Up with thee, sinner. If your feet are ever so black, they will not soil the ladder. Run up with all thy sin and care and come to the Lord Jesus, and he will not cast you away, for he has said, him that comes to me, I will never cast out. My friends, keep this mantra, Jesus only. Amen.